I would like to start uh, with a little story, and it's a story about the open education family. So here it goes. Once upon a time there was a mother, and she was called Open Educational Resources. And she gave birth to her child, and her child was called Mooks. That turned out to be a pretty naughty child, provocative, and even the neighborhood was talking about a disruptive child. So the mother was very concerned about raising this child in dignity and also in the right set of values of openness. Of course, there was a father involved as well, because it was a child that was born, and the father was called Ivy League Universities. This father was not very concerned about raising the child in the right forms of openness. And the mother dumped this guy, and she got in touch with her old relationship, a friend, and this friend was called Open Universities Around the World. And they got to talk about raising the child, and this man became a new husband, and they were very uh, in the same line of raising this child, and uh, what happened was that the child was growing up very speedy in a respectful and responsible way to become a family of the open education, a member of the open education family. Now this is in short what I'm going to talk about, um, and I hope you um, will appreciate my speedy slides. So uh, this was a very slow start, but the slides will be very speedy. Um, anyway. So the content of my, my talk will be about, of course, the popular MOOCs, about opening up education, as has been referred to this morning by the minister already, and, and by Micha. Uh, what are we talking about? And when we use the word open. And then there's a model that I would like to introduce, and we can use the model in different ways by introducing so-called so fingerprints. There's government's responsibilities in, in place for OER, I think, and there's a specific type of uh, MOOCs that we are offering since April this year, which is called uh, Open Web MOOCs, and I have some final observations. Well, this is the, uh, the terrible thing, which is called MOOCs. I don't think they're terrible. I like them very much, so um, don't get me wrong. What are MOOCs? MOOCs are massive open online courses. Now, we know what a course is, more or less, that's not so difficult. And in, in the case of MOOCs, a course is mostly uh, something that's been taken in fixed schedule in a number of weeks. Um, it's to be completed with a certificate of participation mostly, and sometimes you can get a uh, proctored uh, credit certificate. Online is easy, we know what online is. Massive is becoming more difficult already. What is massive? How many learners uh, should you have to really be called massive? And of course the first MOOC uh, had very many uh, participants, 160,000. But you can imagine if so many MOOCs are available that the number of participants will decrease in general. And open is the most difficult one. Uh, it's, of course, it's freely accessible. Uh, you don't have to pay. There's no entry requirements. But there's more to be said about open than the MOOCs normally show. There is a wide variety of MOOCs. Uh, it started actually in Canada, not in the US, uh, as you all know, probably with the CMOOCs um, by George Siemens and Stephen Downs. Um, then the X MOOCs came in. X is more or less referring to content um, type MOOCs in autumn 2011. The first one by Peter Norwick and, and Sebastian Thun from Stanford, which was about AI, uh, a field which I think is very um, common to the, the, the audience here. And you will know this course, I guess. Uh, but there's a lot of diversification, meanwhile, so we're talking about mechanical MOOCs from MIT, we're talking about old MOOCs from the OUK, uh, we're talking about uh, mini MOOCs from the OER University, and more recently we're talking about Open Web MOOCs, Open Web stands of course for opening up education, uh, which is a combination of the classical openness of the open universities and the digital openness that is around in the MOOCs in general and that has been launched in April, early this year. Well, this is the MOOC in English and the MOOC in German. And I would like to refer to an uh, important stakeholder summit that we've had in Europe, in Lausanne, uh, in June, early this year. I was one of those 70 people over there, and we were talking about the European response to the US-dominated movement. And, uh, 
what we see is that many universities from Europe uh, join the consortia in the US, like Coursera or edX, and um, that's uh, quite surprising. So why are we doing that? Why are we not really looking into a European effort, which is also, which might be also very useful? There's one uh, pan-European initiative, which is called Open Abed, and there's a lot of uh, new platforms that have come in. Uh, in Spain, we have Media Dux, in Germany, Iversity, in the UK, there's Future Learn, of course, and since uh, very recently, the French uh, launched the platform which is called France Université Numérique. We made some observations in Lausanne as well, and saw that, that we have some nice assets here in Europe uh, that we could exploit. Um, for example, Bologna and the ECTS scheme, uh, the virtual Erasmus uh, uh, way that we're working, the research record that we have in Europe, um, multicultural uh, environments and public funding, which is different from the US. We have some issues on the table as well, uh, diversity, equality, lifelong learning, learning analytics, of course, then and the degree of openness. And there was a lot of debate about open licensing, yes or no. Um, and of course, the universities remain very important in, in their role of offering an overall curriculum. MOOCs are mostly just courses, so the overall curriculum is very important. Providing services to the courses, uh, providing a social experience, and uh, the dialogue with research, of course, is very important at the university, and also to offer branding and, and infrastructure. Now let's go to the EU, opening up education. Um, this was launched on September 25. It was just in time, I must admit. Uh, I was uh, uh, so happy to, to be involved in the preparations of opening up education. And uh, so we were witnessing that Europe was lagging behind, uh, uh, more or less, and it was time to come with an, a European initiative. And this is, I think, a pretty relevant and also significant initiative. Uh, it's not only in words, but also putting budget, putting money to it. And I think that's important. Uh, we all know Horizon 2020 and Erasmus uh, run from 2014 until 2020 and there will certainly uh, uh, be a lot of money involved in opening up education. It has a broad scope from two directorates, uh, DG Connect and DG Education and Culture, and it has two main uh, lines of thought. The first one being to innovate our teaching and learning uh, for all through ICT, and the second one reshaping and modernizing uh, the education in the European Union through OER, through Open Educational Resources. And then there's also other uh, subjects like digital competencies, which comes from, of course, the DG Connect, uh, infrastructures, interoperability, equity, quality, visibility, licensing, and certification. And it's so much that the Commission says, well, we should really have a concerted effort and an integrated approach. If you think about the term opening up education, we should realize that this is a very well chosen umbrella, uh, much better than open education as such, because it shows that we're talking about a process, it's dynamic. Uh, so we're opening up education towards a certain level, the level that you want. It's not necessary to, to reach 100% openness in all cases. It's a, it's a process which I think is much better uh, to use than just the word open education. Also, by using this term opening up education, you can easily accommodate for diversity, which of course is very important. We all know there is no single ideal model for education. Uh, there's more models uh, leading to successful education, so it doesn't make sense to talk about open education as the single ideal model for the future. It brings in nuance. Now what's really new in, in uh, opening up education, not so much about ICT for teaching and learning. We've done that for decades already with uh, quite some money from the European Commission. Not always successful, I must admit, although I'm in the same world of innovation, of course, with ICT for teaching and learning, but there were also a lot of failures, as you should realize. So that has been there for, for decades already. Not so much about equity and quality that are um, uh, fundamental European values, not so much about infrastructures, we spend a lot of money on infrastructures already, not so much about digital competencies, not so much about digital content, but more so about the agenda for open educational resources, which is a paradigmatic shift, and that's the difference with, let's say, all the other areas which, which are also important. OER is something new in the opening up education program, and of course MOOCs are part of this, this story. Um, well, let's now turn to this word open. What does it mean? Uh, 
I think I can always skip, skip this slide. Of course, we all know that open comes in the digital world from the open source movement, um, which goes uh, quite some time uh, back already. Then there was the open access world uh, for scientific output. Then we had the open content movement, uh, which had to do with creative output and the open educational resources movement OER for learning materials. So that's the openness in the digital world. Now what about open in, in education? Uh, so we use the word open education quite often without really being precise on what does it mean. Um, we know that the open universities world uh, had a good start, or it started already in the 19th century, I must admit, but the real start was, I think, uh, with the open university in the UK in the, in the 70s. And of course, uh, many universities uh, followed up on this model, not only in Europe, but also in the rest of the world. Then in 2001, we had MIT with open courseware, making available all their courses for free on the internet. In 2002, UNESCO uh, found open educational resources uh, as an overall term, coined this term, and saw the uh, big relevance of OER for developing countries. In 2008, there was the Cape Town Declaration, which was more or less an equivalent to the Open Access Declaration from Berlin, uh, 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 making a point about open education. In 2011 and 2008, earlier, we had the, the massive open online courses, and in 2013, the European Union uh, introduced opening up education. So it's always the same open, which is in the term, but what do we mean by that? If you want to find a definition of open education, of course, you look into Wikipedia, and this is just a terrible definition. I don't, I don't want to read it with you because it's, find it yourself, and it's, it's, it is too limited, it's, it's very fragmented and not very precise. This is the definition from May 2013. This is the one from October 2013, which is even, well, it's more extensive, but still, it lacks a lot of um, um, qualities that you would like to see. So it's difficult, apparently, to define open education, and I agree with that. So what we, um, what we did then is to think about open education more or less in a model with different components, and this is the start of it next part of my presentation. Um, and if you think about components in open education and think about, of course, open education resources, which is one of the components, then uh, I can say that OER is pretty well defined and pretty well recognized in its definition by many people in the open education world. So this is a definition I would like to read with you because it, is, it has uh, uh, quite some significance. So OER are teaching, learning and research resources that reside in the public domain or have been released under an intellectual property license that permits their free use, but not only free use, also repurposing by others. Open education resources include full courses, course materials, modules, textbooks, streaming videos, tests, software, and any other tools, materials or techniques used to support access to knowledge. This is a definition by the Hewitt Foundation. The Hewitt Foundation uh, has been very instrumental in, in more than a decade in funding projects all over the world and uh, setting up a strategy in trying to, to mainstream OER. But this definition is also accepted by UNESCO and other bodies. Now, OER is not open education, as you realize. Uh, as I said before, you need more components to get into education. Now, this is the model uh, for education. If you take out the term open, it's just a model for education. So there's open education in the middle, or education. There's open educational resources in the top, or just educational resources. There's open learning services uh, on the right, uh, on the left-hand side, or just learning services, and there's open teaching effort, or just teaching effort on the right-hand side. So it's about resources, learning materials, it's about learning services around those materials, and it's about human effort, which is necessary to make it into education. Um, open learning services, uh, just a description of that, uh, is given here on this slide. Um, this is complementary to OER. It can be free, but it, can also, it, it should also be, in some cases, uh, to be paid for, because somebody should pay the bill if you take education. Uh, there's sometimes a, a misunderstanding that in, in the world of open education, we are always advocating that education should be for free, which is not the case. I mean, uh, it's about OER that should be made for free, but not, not necessarily open education. Well, this includes a variety of online and virtual facilities, um, and you can uh, certainly um, read this out and think what it can be. Open teaching efforts, um, that's the human effort. Of course, you should pay for that. 
that's the human contribution in terms of teachers, developers, and um, trainers, and so on, in their different roles. And the, uh, the environment in which you're working should be also open and flexible. Now, we're not there. This is just a supply side model. And it should also be, also be a demand side. And this is the five component model. So we add two extra components from the demand side. The first one being open to learners' needs and the second one being open to employability and capabilities developments. Open to learners' needs um, is very related on, on the one hand to, let's say, the classical um, openness of open universities like uh, freedom of time, freedom of pace, freedom of place, open entry, open programming, but also learners, of course, want to have doable education. It should be good quality, it should be interesting enough, it should be attractive and it should be beneficial. And of course, also in this category, you can think about uh, provisions for lifelong learning, like credentialing, a, a, well, a good bridge between formal uh, education and informal learning, etc. And the fifth component is open to employability and capabilities developments, OEC, uh, because society, of course, expects education to suit uh, all the changes that we witness in society and the labor market. Uh, we should uh, account for the role of all knowledge and innovation in society and the influence of globalization. But also we should be um, keen on offering scope for new skills, critical thinking, ethics, creativity, personal growth and citizenship. So this is the model, five components. It does uh, justice to diversity and you can use it for mapping and that's what we're going to do now. This is a fingerprint in this five component model of uh, a university that uh, decided to be 100% open education resources. So that's, that's on the right hand side, the slide that is on the right hand side on the top, which is OER. But for example, in terms of openness to uh, employability, uh, this university is not very keen on that. It's uh, their decision not, not to be very active in, in uh, regarding the labor market. Uh, so they are really more supply driven than demand driven. Um, uh, so here are the five components, the three green ones, the three uh, supply side ones, and the two blue ones, the two demand side ones. This is a, a second example of a more a conventional university uh, decided not to do, have anything to do with OER, 0%. But uh, in their case, they are pretty uh, sharp in having a relationship with the labor market, so they decided to have an openness in terms of being closer to employability and they can decide uh, in the future to change their profile, of course, uh, to be more in, involved in OER um, and to maintain their level of um, uh, openness to the employability uh, part. Now, this is a typical XMOOC. XMOOC are the, the MOOCs uh, from, from 2011 and, and, and forth. Uh, so Stanford and MIT and Harvard, um, not really OER because they, they forget about um, the open licensing in many cases, so they, they are not open in terms of repurposing and adapting materials. They only give the materials for free during the, the, the eight weeks that you take the course and then you're uh, closed off. And, and even if you, as university, if you bring your course to Coursera or to edX, um, it's difficult um, to have your, your normal uh, um, opportunities with the course uh, as compared as before. So this is the model of, of an XMOOC. Um, very supply driven, of course, not very demand driven until now. This is the example of a CMOOC, as has been done by Canada, by George Siemens and, and Sebastian Trum, which is 100% OER, has a lot of also interactivity involved, so OLS, I think, should be even more on the right hand side. Anyway, um, so what you do, what you can do with this model is uh, to to accept that there's no single precise definition on open education, but to realize that you can use the model to map yourself uh, with your university or with your, with your initiative um, on uh, what kind of level of openness you, you want to reach or that you reach. There's one exception in my view. I'm a strong advocate for that because I'm a UNESCO chair in OER, and the exception is OER. Um, why is that? So the the position I take here is that OER should be 100% for all of us uh, because it is, um, uh, without any doubt, beneficial uh, for all institutions. Uh, it doesn't matter 
what kind of uh, philosophy you have, it doesn't matter what kind of uh, identity you have, whether you're a secondary school with Montessori or a secondary school on a regular base or a secondary school uh, according to Rudolf Steiner, whether you are an open university, whether you are an, a, a campus-based university, whether you're a university college, in all cases there is a big advantage of sharing the learning materials among all of us. So um, that's an easy uh, statement and I can uh, not prove it, but I can make it plausible. So it's beneficial for all institutions. It's also beneficial uh, independent on the political context. I can give the example of my own country, the Netherlands, where we run a program which is called Wikiwise. It started in 2009 under a minister from the Social Democrat Party, and it has been continued by a minister from the Liberal Party. And, uh, and also the, the, our parliament, uh, it was full agreement with the program, no matter what political party they were of. And of course, it's um, beneficial for all learners, whether you're a formal student or an informal learner or a lifelong learner, it doesn't matter. You all can um, have the advantage of OER. So there's no regret with OER. Number one, number two will follow later, right? Um, this is the introduction to the second no regret. Uh, if you think about the responsibilities of governments for education, and uh, we realize that there's a threefold responsibility of education, that is to promote and ensure accessibility, quality, efficiency in a sustainable manner. Now here's a, a picture where on the left hand side you see a, a situation at a certain moment in a country. This is a three-dimensional picture, so this is the corner of a room and there's the three dimensions, accessibility, quality and efficiency. And if you don't change the conditions or the circumstances, you want to increase, uh, for example, efficiency in the second uh, picture. You see you can do that, so the red triangle uh, increases efficiency, but at the same time you are decreasing quality uh, and also accessibility. I mean, that's normally the case. You, you, cannot, uh, uh, you cannot raise efficiency uh, without having a certain decrease in the other dimensions. If you want to raise the quality, for example, in the last uh, picture, you can do that. See the red triangle, so you raise quality, but at the same time efficiency might, might be decreasing. Now this is the hypothesis in this case, so performance improvement along one dimension, accessibility or quality or efficiency, inevitably deteriorates the performance along one or both of the other dimensions, at least if you don't change the circumstances and conditions. Now look at this, again, the startling situation of this country, and on the right hand side you see the innovation by OER, a system intervention that you're introducing, the red triangle all of a sudden moves uh, all the dimensions, efficiency, quality and accessibility to a higher level. Again, I can't prove it, there's no evidence, but I can make it very plausible. And this is the slide of why this could be true. Um, for accessibility it's easy, uh, because by having all the materials free online available, uh, what can you do better than, than, than um, do this? So th there's no question about that. The second one about quality, um, you can raise quality also by OER because you can involve many peers, many experts in the development of the materials. You can involve users in user evaluation uh, uh, activities. So that certainly can raise quality of the learning materials. And efficiency, that's also pretty easy if we as faculty members or teachers agree that it's not necessary to replicate the efforts of other uh, experienced uh, teachers and faculty members. There's no need to, uh, to develop uh, mathematics scores for a bachelor program 10 times uh, in a country. So that's also easy to understand. Not easy to, to introduce, I must admit, because we all know that we think that our own uh, lecture notes are better than, than those from the others, which is not true. Um, anyway, that's accessibility, quality and efficiency can be raised uh, uh, at the same time by using OER and, and also we can make um, plausible that this is a more sustainable model than we have today. So this is the second no regret with OER. And um, if this is true, I can't think of any government not to decide to embrace a mainstream OER because they wouldn't be wise if they wouldn't do it. So it's an explicit, uh, uh, in my view, uh, governmental OER policy should be introduced, including a set of uh, specific OER measures. And I was quite pleased with the minister's uh, uh, speech this morning, uh, where he showed that uh, Slovenia is very 
uh, did uh, understood, uh, I think, the opening up education movement very well, and and is more or less offering to uh, to have the Slovenian case as a country, as a member state for Europe to show what this can do. Um, so the government here, in my view, is very important to support the OER movement because. Uh, if you see the second paragraph here, if that's the case, if the context is, 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 is offered by the government, it's much easier and more plausible for educational institutions to convert to OER. And that, of course, again, will then turn to, into a significant contribution to the modernization agenda and innovation of education. Um, I have the privilege to, to be asked to be a member of the uh, European Commission High Level Group um, uh, for the modernization agenda recently. And um, I'm quite happy to, to make this combination between, let's say, OER, open education, and uh, the modernization agenda for higher, higher education in the next two years. Now, something about uh, the open about MOOCs, but uh, tomorrow we'll have a, another presentation uh, at the end, uh, in the afternoon. Uh, so that will be more extensive. And um, the launch was on April 25. We had a joint press release with the European Commission. It is an initiative from the European Association of Distance Teaching Universities, which is the uh, association in Europe of the, let's say, the open universities. We are focusing on European values, equity, quality, and diversity. We put the learner at the center. We have high quality learning materials, as you could expect from the open universities. There's a self-study model, and of course, diversity in language and in culture is cherished by us. We're not using English language only. Uh, we're using 12 languages already uh, at the start, and that will even extend. At the launch, we had um, 11 partners. From France, it was the Ministry of Higher Education. There's no open university in France, so it was quite pleasing to have the ministry on board. Then the uh, open university from Italy, from the Netherlands, from Portugal, from Spain, and from the UK. And interestingly enough, the UK OU is involved here in Open Abat, but also um, leading the Future Learn uh, uh, initiative. So they're, they're on both tracks, um, which I think is very important. And Lithuania and Slovakia, uh, the partnership over there was from two technical universities. Also outside of the EU, uh, the Open University from, from Russia in, in Moscow, the Open University from Turkey, uh, Anadolu, and the Open University from Israel. And, and Turkey is a very big operation. So we're talking <coughs> MOOCs, we're talking about 160,000 students, which is quite, quite something. Turkey runs 1.6 million students. Uh, and of course, there are open universities in other parts of the world, which are even bigger. In China, the Open University of China, there's a difference in China, and they run 2.5 or 3.5 million students. That is really massive. Um, planning to join. Um, uh, Slovenia is also planning to join, uh, as we have understood. And there's uh, quite some requests to, um, to join as well worldwide. Uh, I think I'll skip this one to have some time for the last one. Um, final observations and recommendations. Um, first of all, think about the MOOCs in a more common sense view. Um, so early adoption is not possible anymore. We, we, we have seen that in the last uh, uh, two years. So those benefits as early adopter you can't have anymore. Also, exclusivity will dissolve because uh, the number of providers is, is expanding. And even in Coursera and edX, uh, you see uh, new partners coming in that don't have the reputation uh, that the, the original uh, um, uh, institutions had. The massiveness will dilute because if next year or the year after we have 50,000 MOOCs, which can happen, uh, of course, the number of participants per MOOCs will decrease. The sky-high expectation that we've heard uh, thinking about reaching one billion students around the world uh, from one consortium like Coursera or edX, that's really a big illusion because we all know that um, I think this neo-imperialist thought of bringing what the US does or what Europe does to uh, the global south won't work. Africa is self-confident enough, meanwhile, not to say, please give me all the materials and we'll use it. They want to have their own materials. So it doesn't work that way. And of course, there's a problem with the business models, um, and we'll see. Um, and the last one uh, has to do with the title of the presentation. So we're talking about opening up education in a conventional world. And the first uh, uh, issue here is that it really, um, it's very human 
to resist against change. That's what we all are more or less, I, we prefer to, to maintain the work that we're doing. So that's a difficult one. Um, but let them MOOCs be a change agent. That's, I really like the MOOCs because they have brought in some dynamics. They have made politicians think about the idea. They have made uh, university uh, leaders think about what they should do. But please, if we use MOOCs as a change agent, please keep in mind that the, the, the perspective should really, really be about openness in education, so opening up education. So use the power of open uh, as much as possible, but cherish diversity. Uh, there's no regret for OER, as I explained, uh, for two reasons. So that requires government responsibilities and government policies uh, for OER. Uh, you could welcome the Open Abet Initiative as an example of a road that the European Union could take for MOOCs. And, uh, well, if you think about the future of MOOCs, uh, that will normalize anyway, in some time from now, maybe in two or three years. And if it's normalized, um, we'll see um, what the outcome will be. And the last one is the same as the first one. It's us, the human factor, which is really decisive. And uh, in many cases, we are a barrier and we should be a carrier uh, for the European Open Educational Expedition, even though we still don't know where it will end. And I think this is the last one. Yep. Yeah. So.